Okay, it's uh, 3.02 on July 2nd, no. and it's the first meeting of July for the Architectural Advisory Committee. We ask everyone to silence their cell phones. Uh, Planning Director, if we can have roll call. Certainly, Madam Chair. Member Dosi, Member Jakeway. Present. Member Lockyer is excused. Member McCoy. Oh, Member Dosi is just walked in. Okay. Member Rotman. Present. Vice Chair Cassidy. Present. Chair Song. Present. We have a quorum. Thank you. May we have the staff report on the posting of the agenda? Madam Chair, the agenda was posted on Thursday, June the 28th. This meeting has been noticed and posted in accordance with state law. Thank you. Does the committee have any revisions to the agenda for today? Madam Chair, before you get into the committee's revisions, one of the things that we omitted from the agenda was the election of officers. We're supposed to do that at the first meeting in July every year. And apologize, what I would like to do is by a motion and vote of the AAC members, if we could add that as the final item on today's agenda. Okay, that along with any um, changes in the agenda? I don't think there's any. <coughs> okay, no. all right, anybody second that? I'll second. Member Robert? Let's see, who was the first who made the motion? I made a motion. Okay. Sorry. Great. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. Since this is a public meeting, audience members are permitted to comment on any issue that is within this <coughs> committee's preview. Just by a show of hand, are you here to speak about any issue that is not on today's agenda? Okay, since there's none, we will proceed to the meeting minutes from last, uh, I'm sorry, from the June 4th um, Architectural Review Committee meeting. And just for the benefit of the members of the AAC, we did not get the June 18th meeting. It's completed in time to include with the agenda, so we'll have those for your next agenda. Okay, thank you. Is there, if there's no remissions, um, Member Robert, would you care to make a motion to accept? I move to accept the uh, minutes from June 4th as submitted. Madam Chair, does that motion include all items on the consent calendar? That's correct. Okay. I agree. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Can you one second that? Okay. Thank you, Member Tom. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. So with that, uh, the final plan development district for Infusion Beach having been approved on the consent agenda, that will go forward to the Planning Commission. So thank, thank you very you. much. So we will move on to new business number three. Identity Mutual representing Quick Quack Car Wash. Quick Quack here. Okay. Okay. Located on the Palm Springs Parket, uh, Marketplace Shopping Center located at 1717 East Bisticino. Staff report, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. The slide that's before you today is showing you the location of the pad site within the Marketplace Shopping Center. It's the box in yellow, and it's on along Vista Chino between the Auto Zone, which is to the west, and then the O'Reilly's Auto Parts, which is to the east. So that's just to orient you as to where we're where we're looking at. So the site plan shows uh, the siting of the building between the parking lot of O'Reilly's and then the building of Auto Zone. So it is a 2,900 square foot building with a double queuing lane that pulls into a, a pay station and then single file they will go into the wash tunnel of the building uh, and come out uh, on the north side and circulate back into the driveway within the park, uh, the, within the driveway of the shopping center. And then we'll exit out to um, a, a traffic light along Cerritos or out towards um, Sunrise. There is also a vacuum station which is covered uh, with a canopy to the east or at the bottom of the slide. 
Uh, and also on the site, there is a large trash enclosure to handle uh, the refuse and also an enclosure for the vacuum equipment. Uh, that's all along the, the bottom of the slide or the east property line. I'd like to point out that there also is a pedestrian entrance or, in, or connection to the site from the street sidewalk along Vista Chino. And also there is a uh, screen wall that is it's shown on this plan as three feet tall that is adjacent to Vista Chino when actually it needs to be four feet and the applicant has uh, agreed to raise it to meet the standards of the zoning code. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a little bit later. So this is the landscape plan showing uh, enhanced landscaping along the five foot wide strip of land that's between the sidewalk and the screen wall that we talked about. Uh, that will screen the cars that are queued to pay and go into the car wash. Uh, there's landscaping to the north uh, next to the auto zone. Uh, there's some landscaping to the south uh, or the east at the bottom of the slide to the parking lot of the O'Reilly's and then some other landscaping that is towards the driveway aisle within the um, shopping center. So the plants are a mix of Palo Verde trees and other desert uh, landscaping and palm trees. I will direct your attention, it's kind of hard to see. There's a very narrow strip of land uh, that's between the driveway, the internal driveway, and then the driveway of the, the mm -hmm. shopping center. Uh, they're proposing to put a mesh fence there and then to add some plantings. Uh, and we at staff are not sure how that would work. And that may be one of the, uh, the, the items that the AEC uh, will look at uh, in greater detail. The architecture of the building, it's uh, the ma maximum height for the middle portion within the tunnel, wash tunnel was 27 feet tall. Uh, the lower portions are 14 and the canopies, the pay, the pay station canopy is 10 feet tall and also the canopy that uh, covers the vacuum is 10 feet tall. Um, I have the material board that I'm gonna circulate around to everybody. So the base of the building is a CMU block, uh, multiple shades. Uh, there are multiple shades, there are, there are several columns that are of the darker brown. Uh, the upper portion of the building is stucco and the uh, element that uh, delineates the wash tunnel is uh, a lighter uh, brown or yellowish. Uh, in the center of the building, in the white, that is where will, they will place a sign. So the sign, uh, the, the marketplace has a sign program uh, and any signs that were submitted to uh, for the building will be evaluated based upon the sign program. This is an elevation of the vacuum uh, area. There's the canopy and then the, the round uh, items are for trash cans and then you'll see on the very right side is the, the vacuum equipment screen. Uh, this is a cross section showing what will be visible from Vista Chino and from the multiple sides of the building, the, the, both of the auto parts stores and also from inside the driveway of the shopping center. In your packet, there's also a, a floor plan that shows how the building operates. There's a cashier's office, uh, a, a manager's office, and then an employee lounge and then equipment areas. So there's no access to the building from, in, from um, in customers to the building. On the roof, there is mechanical equipment that uh, will be on the east side of the building facing the uh, vacuum canopy area, and it will be fully screened behind um, a parapet. Also in the packet, there's a topography exhibit. There is a preliminary grading plan. Uh, and then at the end, we have some uh, 3D images of what the building will look like. As we mentioned, there is a screen wall that is along Vista Chino to uh, hide the, the cars that are queuing. This is a requirement and common in the, in the shopping center. There's other uh, fast food restaurants that have the same uh, situation. There's a McDonald's and a Taco Bell that also have similar screen walls. And this is showing the pedestrian access to the site, uh, the one large Palo Verde tree that's proposed, another landscaping, and uh, the different colors of the building. And the material board has been sent around with the, the paint chips for everyone to see. And the final slide is the, um, is the site plan. 
Uh, one item that was that needs to be evaluated more is a site lighting. Uh, the site lighting plan that was submitted is does not meet the standards of the zoning code. Uh, it's too bright, so they need to come back with a new site lighting plan, um, basically cutting the lights in half. So staff is recommending approval uh, to the AEC, uh, and your recommendation will go to the Planning Commission. This is a conditional use permit application and a major architecture application. The CUP is required uh, because a car wash needs a CUP approved by the Planning Commission. So and my recommendations to the AAC, uh, one is to provide greater architectural details of the screen wall along Vista Chino, raise the wall to four feet, the wire mesh fencing along the internal driveway. Um, one other item, there's a light strip. If I can go back to the color drawings. So on the, in the middle east elevation and west elevation, there is a light strip that runs along under the eave of the building. And uh, the applicant may want to describe what that is. Is it an LED light? Is it neon? What is it? We, there's no detail of that. Um, uh, that uh, concludes my report. There is additional information that is, was given to you by one of the neighborhood organizations. Uh, the, the city notifies all neighborhood organizations within a half mile. Uh, and uh, they responded back uh, in support of the project. So that concludes my report, and uh, the folks from Quick Quack are here. Okay, any questions for staff? Yeah, no? Okay, is the uh, applicant present? Your name and address. Uh, Michael Clark, Identity Mutual, 2980 East Northern Avenue in Phoenix, Arizona. Okay, so this is a chance for you to add to the presentation before we ask the audience to comment. Uh, and if you have no other addition, then we will open up to uh, the audience. No, I'll, I'll just give you a, just a quick overview. Uh, quick Quack is uh, based out of Roseville, uh, Sacramento area. Uh, this will be their sixth or seventh, depending on the timing of it, uh, here in the Coachella Valley. They have uh, three acquisitions. Uh, one opened up in Coachella this uh, past December. One will open up later this month in uh, Desert Hot Springs. We have a ground up uh, in Cathedral City as well as this site. Uh, Quick Quack has approximately 50 locations. Uh, they'll add about 30 this year. Uh, all Express, it's a touchless uh, car wash. We have two employees on site, so there's not a bunch of uh, employees loitering, if you will. Uh, uh, not that they are loitering, but that's what it often looks like on those full service uh, deals when they're drying your car and all that. So uh, we don't offer any product for sale. It's, uh, we offer car washes and vacuums, uh, and that's it. Uh, as you can tell, this is the, the elevation. Um, we we try to take the, uh, the Chick-fil-A model, if you will. Uh, if, if the CEO were here, uh, he would say, look, you can, you can go to a lot of, you have a lot of different opportunities, but we want to offer the best customer experience. We treat our employees the best. We want to build a better building that looks better, blends in architecturally. Um, one of the things that, uh, that staff pointed out uh, on the, uh, the canopies, those are a metal canopy. Uh, a lot, it's a standing seam metal. Uh, that's uh, fabricated by Quick Quack. Uh, one of the things that uh, you see in our com competition a lot of times is it'll be like a mesh or a cloth. It deteriorates. It really doesn't offer much protection to the customer from the sun. It does get a bit warm here. Uh, so that's just some of the highlights. Um, we're very environmentally friendly. Uh, three 1,500-gallon reclaim tanks. Uh, they capture 100% of the water. Uh, the Western Car Wash Association estimates that uh, if you wash your car in your driveway, in addition to washing dirt and grease and oil down the street, uh, you're also using between 125 and 150 gallons of water. We use, on average, about 18 gallons of water per car with fresh water that's introduced. Okay, thank you. Um, is anyone here to make comments on this project? Okay, so uh, we have some questions for you. Sure. Okay, I'd like to start with uh, Member Tom Dalsey. 
Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could just quickly, um, based on the site plan, uh, run us through how, you know, when a patron enters and wants to get their car washed, you know, kind of the circulation and um, how that works. Sure. Mike, um, you want to stand up there? Yeah, sure. Ah. <clears throat> So uh, our car wash, again, it's uh, ex express model. It is only, uh, we, the, car, the customers don't get out of their car unless they're using the free vacuum. So uh, when you're coming off, whether you're coming from the shopping center or off of Vista Chino around um, our neighbor here, you come in through the back, you pull through and around the front into our stacking lanes. At this, this point, um, we have stacking for, I think this will hold up 18 cars or so. Um, the, the canopies are covered here where we have our employees that use a tablet-based POS system. So they take your order, essentially. You pull through and then into the, uh, into the tunnel here and exit at this end. Um, we do have a, quote-unquote, emergency exit. It's more for things if, you, if a, um, one of our employees sees something hanging off the car, not that there's many antennas anymore, broken antennas, et cetera, rather than having them back up, this is the, the escape here. So this is one way, and it's rare, very rarely used. So as the customers leave, they can, they can use the vacuums either before or after the wash, um, and then they exit the same way that they came in on this site. Okay. I, I guess the reason for my question is, um, and, and I believe it's, it's your brand in Rancho Mirage there at Frank Sinatra and Highway 111, one of your car washes. Frank Sinatra. Oh, yeah, that, okay, I know which one. I was thinking of the other one. Yeah, the ones that we have, the, the, um, we have acquired three, um, including that one. I'd say the desert wash on Washington at Fred Waring is probably the closest to what we would offer. Um, of course, we have the one in Coachella on the opposite end of the valley from you. Those are more representative of, of what we build. So um, in order to accelerate their entry into the market, they have acquired okay. some, but they don't, unfortunately, they don't stand up necessarily to what we build ground up. I, I guess where I was going with this is that I was I've experienced the one in Rancho Mirage, and it, it seems to function very well. And in this site plan, um, and again, you know better as an operator the volumes of vehicles and so forth, but I didn't know if there would be some efficiency to the site. It just seems like there's a lot of paving and drives where, you know, if some of the um, ancillary, like the vacuums and, um, and do you really need two double lanes for stacking and, and just... It, it seems like a, the, the one that I've visited has less hardscape and seems to function very well. So I didn't know if there were, if this is kind of a standard or if this is what needs to. This is uh, this site just because of the constraints of the site um, has been a tough one for us to site plan. Um, we do need the two stacking lanes. In a lot of places, we'll do three. Um, mostly, and it, a lot of it is optics. Uh, so we can generate through this tunnel about 160 cars an hour, like if that's absolutely going through the, the top speed. We average wash between 450 and 500 cars a day. So we don't have, we don't have to worry about, you know, about too much stacking because we don't want, obviously, to have any conflicts here. Uh, but to go down to a single lane would probably increase the risk of us of having the conflict at the exit of the tunnel, which would which would stop the site. But the way it's designed now and the way we've projected it, there there won't be any traffic conflicts there. Because I think, like in Rancho Mirage, there's double purpose with mm -hmm. the attendant aisle mm -hmm. and the vacuum area, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. just so I didn't know if you had explored those options. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just the way uh, the way that the site, the constraints and the way that the site narrows up here, we've tried to do some different, we've been working on this site for about two and a half to three years now, I would say. Um, so we really want to be here, we really want to be in Palm Springs, and this is the layout that we've, we've been, uh, that we feel works the best and, and offers the best experience for the customer. Okay, thank you. Okay. Is this a corporate design where you use the same design for all of your new car washes that you're building? Uh, we, the only thing that's sacred to Quick Quack really are the links of the tunnel. 
Uh, the, and, and I'll say that because we have three standard lengths and this is not one of those three standard lengths, <laughs> uh, just because again, the design, the constraints here. Uh, the only thing that, that we uh, really like to see on our elevation is the, is the arch feature that's, that you see on the entry and the exit. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, so that's really a that's really a branding thing. Everything else, the materials and all of that, we do that just to, to blend in to match the center. In in most cities, we live in Phoenix, um, and we develop here in California, and in and in Texas. And in Texas is the only thing where we can kind of do a cookie cutter. Everywhere else, we really have to do to blend in to uh, to local uh, the shopping center and local design. Um, the building looks quite tall. Is there a technical reason that you need to have extra height over the wash tunnel? Uh, no, this is, um, we're only 27 feet here. We typically build to 30. Um, in Phoenix, we have one that's 35 feet. So we're not as, I don't believe we're as tall as our neighbors. I think their neighbors on either side of us are 28 or 30 feet. But there's nothing up in that area above the wash lane. Uh, no, the, the equipment <laughs> runs basically, uh, you know, underneath where the, the parapet would be. And could you explain a little bit about the light that Glenn mentioned, the strip light? Yeah, it won't be on the next plan. Okay. That makes it easy. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Member Robert, question for the applicant. Um, where do your employees park? Uh, our employees will park in the, uh, we have cross-parking agreement with the um, shopping center so they can park on the opposite side. And then um, what kind of wayfinding do you, for the first person, first customer, first time customer, what kind of wayfinding do you provide so that they know where they go and they're not turning in the tunnel early or you know what 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 do you what what typically do you do um the you know the this the site is you know we will have extra we'll have grand opening and we'll have you know a period of uh of free car washes uh, and we'll have extra staff for that um this uh, a lot of times this area here is coned off so when the customer comes in the only area they can they can come in is is through here okay do you put in any tire spikes or anything like at the end of the uh, tunnel so people don't turn in, or is there anything like that? No, um, and I don't think we have any. I'm Has looking at my partner show. Yeah, but there, there's no, there's no, there's nothing that would prevent. The, there's nothing uh, we wouldn't want it because, especially here where we have multiple, we have t basically two way. We don't have any uh, any spike strips or anything like that. Okay. Um, Okay, thank you. Okay, Member Kenny. I think my questions were answered, so I'm good. Thank you, though. Okay. So um, piggybacking, I think one, one, uh, one of the circulation situation right now is that it's two ways. So pretend that I'm coming to, which I have in other facilities, <laughs> uh, pretend I'm coming into that driveway that has the vacuum, okay? So I'm coming in, and then I'm doing the full loop right and then I get stacked and then from there I turn to go inside get the car clean and then I come out and then I park because I want to vacuum inside the car mm -hmm. then at the same time let's say a member of Kenny comes in right so you have the same driveway for people coming in as people leaving out yeah it's a uh, that's a 24 foot wide drive from the the pavement to the uh, to the uh, outside of the canopies so it's a standard uh, width for a shopping center. I, I understand, but it's it's where you're bringing people in as well as where you're letting people out. So one of the questions is, have you considered a layout in which only people who, so if the vacuums are on the way out only, so pretend for a moment like the whole building is flipped and then you have the entry driveway from the west side and so you stack them on the left side so it's just one single sort of um uh script in which people come out and then leave have you have you considered that kind of scenario uh, i would say yes I'd, I'd i would let joe talk to the site plan there's a little more to the site planning You give, he gets the hard questions. Hi. My name is Joe Walters, and I'm with the same company and the same address as Mike, so I'll keep it short. Our original plan and some of the questions you're asking, we talked 
about trying to have an entry here oh, yeah, no off way. of this chino. <laughs> yeah, and, this is and, and they didn't totally laugh at us. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but, but with the state controlling that and everything else, uh, we also, one of the very initial plans, this entire layout was flipped, trying to get the vacuums over here, but because of the shorter distance, uh, length of the property line, and the requirements of the setbacks, and there's a kind of a 50% rule. I can't remember exactly what that was, Glenn. We had to flip this around. We've been in a process of working on this site, actually, and that's why Mike doesn't know some of this before he came over to work on, on the team. <coughs> uh, the reason this lot hadn't developed wherever there was a lawsuit with Stater Brothers and a shopping center owner, and they finally settled all that. And, Got all the releases. I don't know all the details of that, but we've been held up for a long time wanting to submit this. I think uh, planning got tired of us showing up saying we're ready to start, and then we call them a year later. But uh, <clears throat> the uh, we have this type of layout in numerous locations, and that's another reason, like Mike is, was talking about, is the two stacking lanes. And, and one other thing that he, he – I can't remember who asked that question about the stacking – Sir, was it you? But uh, the outside lane also becomes an express lane for the for the membership members. Mm -hmm. They'll uh, have signage up for that, where the people that buy the monthly pass they can go through, because they'll have license plate recognition and the ability to keep them moving quicker than the person that's a first time user. But you end up with the stacking lanes so you don't back traffic in front of of where the vacuum is parked. <clears throat> we've we've never had a problem with that. You also, Mike's saying you've got a 24 foot drive, but you have a, I can't read that. It's a five or six foot sidewalk, and uh, so when a car backs out, they have additional space to back over instead of having to worry about a car behind them. But uh, we've got this this type of a layout in numerous locations around the country, and uh, never had a problem with it. Okay, uh, and and you. See that um, traffic island strip that you see running um, east-west? Yeah. This. Up higher, up higher. You see a curb. You, are you talking about on the inside of no, it? No, go up, up, up. Okay, uh, follow, the, follow that curb line all the way to the left side, please. Yes, right okay. here. Yeah, and then follow it down. Is, oh. that, is that like an 8-inch curb? What is that? That is a... You know, most of the uh, uh, most of the curb around the perimeter is a six-inch curb and gutter, mm -hmm. or a, or a freestanding curb, depending upon the grade. The interior curbs, where you come into here on this side, <coughs> excuse me, are a lazy back curb, so people don't hit their hit their rims and stuff on them if they cut the corner short. Uh -huh. We we are uh, in a, in the final design going to shorten this tunnel just a little bit. So they have a better experience on that turn in, and uh, the uh, rest of it will pretty much stay the same. Like Mike said, it was discussed. The strip lighting is LED. We've got too much light on the site in the first place, so that'll be eliminated. Okay. Okay. Um, then going back to the uh, design of the building, um, so. A couple of things that I wanted to ask on, for example, on A200. So on the very top, what is the, on the, on the white surface where it says S4, what do you plan to add in there? This, this will end up being where their uh, corporate signage goes. That'll have signage. And that's just kind of a area that distinguishes differently from the sign. Okay, and but below that is where the vehicle, um, I believe, exits, right? Yes, this is the tunnel, uh -huh. the arch. Uh, and then up above that, it will be some sort of this, acrylic This is material. for signage up here. For yeah. signage, okay. And when you mentioned about the arch being the only item that cannot, that it's part of the signature. Well, that's... That's their brand identity as a whole. All of the, all of the newer buildings that we're doing, this building, the, the difference is this building because of what Mike's talking about, site constraints is a little shorter. Uh, the tunnel 
itself and the structure are usually the same. Their ideal height on this is uh, 30 feet. We were asked to shorten it uh, by planning early on, and we complied with that. The standing seam metal, the stucco, this is uh, all block with different type block materials. Normally in the desert scheme, the, the new car washers they're doing, this is a, a stacked stone material, but we were asked to eliminate that. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I think what Mike is really saying is some of the materials and colors to get into certain areas, we become more flexible than you. But, but you, if you look at the bottom elevation, the proportion where you have the three windows on your left side, these, yes. Yeah. Do you see where that band that you have created, do you see where it's located? It's so low that it makes the top be so top heavy. This is this is a canopy, an eyebrow canopy. You can kind of see it in the side view right there. Okay. But the stone stops at that canopy, and then above that is plaster? Well, the stone, this is block infill, and then this is a different block. Right. Uh, so where does the stone around the window stop? Well, we took the stone off. No, so no, no. the darker color is is one color block, and I, I don't... It's CMU, have, right? Yeah, it's all Concrete CMU. Block. Okay, now back where the, you have the three windows. Are you talking about where these stop or the height of the canopy? Are you wanting to increase yeah. the lower material in height? Yeah. We can do that. Okay, and then where you see... Right now, they look like as if there were pilasters or columns at the corner. You want those to go all the way up? That could be a case, but some cities see? want them to go all the way up. Their their typical corporate view, they. Stay I don't down. think you should go all the way up because you you want to emphasize the size of the cap. Okay? Well, otherwise, it looks too thin, and then you have the pilaster. But if you go to the top elevation, do you see how you see the side thickness of it? But yes. that should really wrap around the corner if they seem to be we as... Can, uh, we can wrap these to the side of the arch. Right, but the arch then needs to be smaller because otherwise it conflicts with the pilaster design. Well, <clears throat> I don't know if we have a picture or one handy. What we've done, and we, we can work with staff to do this or have them present it back to you. What we have done is where this comes around we would basically sometimes we've adjusted the height to where it ties in here. Other times it's gone, you know, to about the bottom of the white and across and all this area outside of the arch would but become it almost the lower seems, material. But it almost seems like you can have that whole surface be <coughs> the type of the material of the pilaster and then within that is where you have the arch opening. So now it looks like it's the well, This is a, if, if you could see in the side view, the, the kind of a yellowish, color that is is kind of their corporate look the arch this angles outward from the bottom to the top and that's a, a, a stucco material and then you have the block beside right. it. this is a different color stucco but instead but of stopping it at that point you can have that material be your back surface and yes. then have your arch be in front yeah. of it so you, or in the back so that it creates it, it's creating a canvas for your arch to for the I don't, part I don't to go understand, through instead but, of being two different materials. But I don't think we we would take if we do that. Typically, what we do is we take this material, and if you see this line that kind of dashes across, we typically turn it all the way around and bring the darker material all the way to the golden part, all the way around it. Oh yeah, that's much better. We can do that. Yeah. Um, then going back to those three windows, just the question is, if, since they're so close together, why not then make the whole span one window? The, you, you, <clears throat> you need the structural column in between. They try not to have steel or rust. This, the roof structure on this is a holocore precast. And what we're trying to build is uh, you've got masonry lintels across the top of the windows to keep any steel out of the building. Uh, they don't want rusting of the materials. No, I'm sorry. I'm talking about the building itself, the, 20, the 27 feet. You're talking between these three windows? Yeah. To make that one big window? Yeah. That's the, the masonry in between is a pilaster to support the structure. But you can have two oversized pilasters on each end and make that a clean span. 
I'm trying to I'm trying to see if there's a way to clean up the elevation so instead of having punches it's actually more composed to your tower I call it the tower element mm -hmm. and then your entry see how your entry is seen as a much larger width with the double doors and then the windows you can see that's an entry you're talking here yeah yeah uh, no one's ever asked us about making that one it uh, from a structural standpoint with the seismic in California I I hate to say we could do that right off because that's quite a span across there in the in I'll bet you the amount of rebar that you're putting on each individual pilaster rather than oversizing the last two will be a wash mm -hmm. yeah the, the blocks pretty much completely full of rebar out here anymore Oh, yeah, we know. You, you, your old seismic district doesn't help a lot. I, I would have to reserve an answer to that okay. if you would let me and, and explore it because I just can't. Uh, the other things like moving the masonry and that, I can commit to, I know we can do that. Okay. So uh, the uh, torchlight yellow, <coughs> the color chip that was uh, passed around, this mustard, is this a corporate color as well? Yes. Okay. And that's the one I get the most grief of. They, their, their real corporate so color they want is bright yellow and green. <laughs> yeah, we come we a were, long way. We <laughs> one, 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 I worked with four and a half years, and the first thing I did when they wanted us to help was said, we got to change this look. And we took what really looked like a bright yellow and green car wash and tried to make something that looked more office retail. And we literally went back and forth with the owners of the company and their design committee and, and uh, uh, fired a couple of architects that they had that couldn't come up with something. And they, in the last year, they've, they've given us more flexibility on colors and some of the things you're asking about, but there's certain things they kind of get really upset with me about. And that's where Mike's saying the biggest element detail is kind of this in this market to keep brand identity. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Uh, one more question from member Tom. The CMU block, it looks... The CMU block, it looks like it's a polished face block, but the rest of the shopping center is all split face concrete block. Would you consider using a split face that matches the other buildings that are in the shopping center? I like the different colors and all, but just a little different texture to the face of the block. You're saying typically what we've done is this has been a ground polished block up mm -hmm. above, and they've had the stone below, but you'd like to see split face and split face, but with these colors. I think it ties it in better to, That's, to the neighboring buildings. I'll get, I'll get in trouble, but I'll say yes. <laughs> He just saved you some money. Maybe I yeah, can get that pilaster gone. And you know what? They're screaming about budgets with costs going up, so and that's The that last helps. question is, I'm surprised there's no public <coughs> bathroom. Has it been an issue with maybe people are on and off the site quick enough that you only need the one for staff? But They typically don't have a, an employee or, or, I, or, I mean, a public restroom anywhere. Some of the car washes, you know, the acquisitions they've made do. Uh, they really had more of a vandalism problem and stuff with them than a person needing those. And, you know, I mean, they, they kind of look at it like they're in a shopping center and you've got the restaurants and the grocery store and things. And if they're bringing traffic in and people have to get out and go somewhere else, they're kind of helping with that. But all of the new locations that are being designed, they do not have a public restroom anywhere. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to start from this side. Member Robert, comments and discussion points? Can you come back to me? Sure. <laughs> okay. I'm going to start from the other side then. Uh, Member Tom Dosey. Is this where we give our comments? Yes. Okay. Um, I noticed on the site plan that there is a proposed flagpole. Um, is there a height for that? Or it, it doesn't show in the renderings, but I'm, I'm, 
A003 it's mm -hmm. in, in the corner there. So mm -hmm. I didn't know if it was just a standard size flag pole or one of those giant, yeah, by the mm -hmm. car dealerships. Mm -hmm. So I think there needs to be some clarification on that. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. We will we will discuss and then we'll we'll yeah. Thank you. Okay, continuing on. Um, and and I'm I'm kind of with you, like going through the circulation because it it seems like where you enter this wayfinding, I think that was brought up. You have to really go all the way around the building to find you know where you actually sign up and pay for your car wash and 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 go through. So. But but I'm sure they they've studied this exhaustively and and um, ho hopefully this is the best efficient be because I do see some conflict in the one in Rancho Mirage you know, you'd come in the nearest aisle where those uh, vacuums are and then you immediately turn into the car wash capture you yeah yeah rather right. than going all the way around mm -hmm. and then you come back out and um, so. I don't know if they investigated that. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the landscape plan, uh, there's uh, palm trees that are proposed uh, along Vista Chino at a eight foot height. I think with the height of the building, those certainly, I don't think they need to, I, I believe there's existing palm trees out there. They don't need to match that height, but they mm -hmm. should be at least 14 feet in height mm -hmm. um, initially. And on the east side of the property between um, O'Reilly Auto Parts, th there's some small uh, hedge material or landscape material near the vacuums. And, and the proposed plant there is a, it's a very small plant that gets 12, 18 inches in height. And th they may want just either more of them or something a little bit larger because a lot of people you know, I could just see them cutting through there. It's, it could get trampled and, and not survive after mm -hmm. a period of time. And those are my comments. Thank you. Um, Tom, while you ha I have you on that, um, so on the uh, landscape island that comes in where they have the stacking lane, uh, there's there's two designs. One is, is actually on page A003, they have it identified as decorative spheres. Um, and then on the landscape plan, they have um, uh, put a composition of also additional planting in between, as well as the, I believe there's a, um, a palm fawn on that bigger island before they turn into the stacking lane. So this is more like a tight urban question oh, when you right. have such little strip uh, where the plants do well and if, if, if the staff are walking around, um, would it be better served practically to you know, leave it more of DG rather than hev hev heavily uh, landscaping it? Um, are you, we, the palm symbol yeah, on that corner. Uh, that's a, a dwarf palm, like a Mediterranean palm. Right. So that's going to be shorter and bushy, which which I think would be okay. Okay. And, and then moving along down? Um, the material along there, more of a ground cover type material, so it's it's not going to block anything. And but people won't step on rid of them? No, it, because it, it sounds like the function of it is most of the people In the car. will be, yeah. Okay. I don't think ever. Okay, very good. Okay. Unless um, they added a restroom, yeah. <laughs> which could be beneficial if you're vacuuming your car. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Member Tom Jakeway. Um, I wonder if any consideration has been given to taking the vacuum clean vacuum area that's got a roof over it and attaching that to the building so that instead of having this freestanding shade structure, it becomes more of a cohesive architectural piece, and that might help to cut down the feeling of the height of the building. Uh, I think that the idea of wrapping those columns all the way around to make it a wall is, is brilliant. You know, it w really improves that front mm -hmm. facade. Um, and the, I think one of the big questions is, what is this painted metal frame with wire mesh fence that separates the parking lot of the shopping center from the uh, lanes of the 
uh, car wash because that could be a pretty significant part of the Design. appearance of the building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, Member Robert, I have to come back to you. Um, I went online, and their co corporate logo is a duck. Yeah, green. And uh, my and and I understand corporate identity. Um, the feel of this feels like you're entering a Disneyland lot r ride. Um, and I'm not sure how to suggest to sort of make it less Disneylandish and a little bit more architectural and fitting for the Palm Springs. Um, I like your idea of wrapping uh, the pilasters. I'm not sure they should be at the same height that they currently are. I, I think it might conflict with the whole entry thing, so maybe they get dropped down. Um, I also agree, Maria, with your point about the three windows on the side. They just they feel very cramped, mm -hmm. and I think either uh, removing the surrounds around the window mm -hmm. or doing some making them narrower might help that elevation. Um, and uh, and I have I have concerns also about the circulation. I think your point, Maria, about uh, coming into the vacuum area after you. Um, after you have your car wash and then have to deal with backing out while people are entering uh, or crossing traffic seems a little convoluted. And uh, but if they said they've done this before and it works, I, I you know I can't really argue. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wish the building were a little less busy. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I you know that's without going ahead and redesigning it. I just wish it were a little less busy. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, Member Kenny. Um, I'll, I'll echo the sentiment about um, Chair uh, Song's um, changes to the pilasters and the wrapping. I was trying to figure out a way to do that in mm -hmm. my head, and I think you talked it in the right direction. I might even suggest that as the pilasters wrap around the corners in order to resolve all that's happening with that, I don't want to call it a golden arch, but all that's happening with that arch. Um, maybe they get shortened uh, down so that they line up with something happening uh, as it comes around the corner. Um, that was one suggestion. The other one was I was noticing that the coping that runs along the west elevation uh, and runs into the first pilaster seems to be at a higher uh, height on the side of the building than what I think is a trellis above the window. So it would be nice if that were a continual uh, line that ran, a, you know, seemingly through the pilaster. Mm -hmm. So those, I think, would be better off if they were lined up. Um, I also share some of the same concern about the crisscross traffic happening uh, at the entrance uh, with cars having to cross over each other's traffic lane to get in and out of uh, uh, the uh, vacuum area. And I think perhaps the, yeah, the I mean, I, I, I would just have to say, you're the experts. You know what works, uh, and, and de <coughs> defer to that. But perhaps the idea of moving the uh, vacuum um, lanes up attached to the building might help resolve that. Um, but it certainly would help resolve the, the height the height visibility issue. So uh, those are my thoughts on it, but um, I'll stop there. I think to the idea from Tom about moving it, moving the um, shaded carport to the building so that there's more relief between the building and the driveway, I think that's excellent. Um, and then this idea that when you're turning right after you got your car wash, you know, you're turning right closer to the drive aisle that has the vacuum. Um, I think that may, so I think overall we're, we're very excited that this kind of project is coming in and it gives an alternative you know, a choice to car wash. And I think it's in the right location because it's very busy and so on. And I sympathize with the a number of years that it took for this project to come through. I think it's there. It just need quite a bit of tweaking, um, both on the site and the exterior elevation. And I'm wondering if we can do this as a committee uh, where we can give him the directions of how to better proportion um, sort of the exterior elevations and then the driveway so that we can have a more dialogue rather than, you know, going at it and then see if they can guess right on what we're doing. 
Madam Chair, I think based on your comments, it would probably be more helpful to go to a subcommittee where you can actually get down into the drawings and look at those details specifically. So staff would support that recommendation if you'd like to do that. Thank you. Um, so based on that, it would be something like we approve the intent, but we need to have it to go to subcommittee. What I would recommend is that you uh, approve the project subject to subcommittee review, identifying the issues that we have listed here in your discussion points. Uh, and once the subcommittee has reviewed it, we'll forward it on to the Planning Commission with those final recommendations. So um, I make a motion that we go to subcommittee, um, but yeah, that's the motion. <laughs> <laughs> Either we have a second or... Mm -hmm. I'll second. Are you... A question? Yes. Are you moving as part of your motion that we approve the project subject to the uh, subcommittee's recommendations? Absolutely. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So we have a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, no. Anyone opposed? Okay. So now, dun dun, dun subcommittee. <laughs> <laughs> Minimum of two. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that is an excellent idea. <laughs> I, I would be happy to help out with that. Thank you, Tom. Okay. Um, Maybe. Okay, I'll, I'll do it. Okay, thank you, Kenny. Can I just add that uh, you incorporate the fence along the yeah, part of this the, the, resubmittal? The design, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, we're quite concerned because the idea is good, but there's very little surface area. So. Okay, very good. Let's move on to new business item number four, Woodbridge Pacific Group requesting approval of final development plans for a previously approved preliminary plan development district in phase one of the Maryland development. Um, if we can have the staff report. We did take a vote on that. Yeah, that was kind of quiet. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, okay. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. I'm members of the AAC. So um, the item you have before you today, most of you who have been on the board for, uh, for a while must have seen this. Um, uh, before, that is when it came to you uh, as an amendment and then um, also an amendment to the original uh, preliminary plan development district. So at that time, if you recall, that was in 2016, we brought it to you uh, not only to change the uh, development standards, but also the design guidelines was part of uh, what you reviewed way back in 2016. And at that time, you made a recommendation of approval both to uh, the Planning Commission and the City Council. They took your recommendation and approved the project. So a little background before I call on, the, on uh, Mr. Cunningham, because it's indicated that uh, he will be making a presentation to you. So he will be doing the design aspect of it. But I want to give you a little bit more about the processing of this uh, project. We've talked before about preliminary development. This is the final. We talked about... Uh, development district uh, PDD being two steps. The first step is uh, the preliminary, where you see the massing, the site planning, but then the final is when you see the details uh, and, and most of the things or the conditions that the AAC, the Planning Commission or Council, uh, it is at this stage that all those are incorporated into the design. But what is also unique about this uh, project is that Unlike the different uh, PDD or final PDD that we brought to you in the past, again, this development, the mirror loan, has its own uh, design guidelines, which means unlike other projects that are generic in design, so to say, this project has specific design guidelines that you will be evaluating this PDD against today. In other words, so the attachment that we provided you has both the proposal and the 
um, the green copy, this one here, that, that, that represents the um, development standard. That was where uh, those three variations of design and um, material um, and uh, other components of the design is based upon. So if you go to your memo, uh, those are, you have some excerpts from these design guidelines that are incorporated into that staff report, and that's what this uh, final PDD will be evaluated against. So th this is the overall, uh, the, the slide you see now is the overall uh, site plan of the Mural Lawn Project. And the dark areas where uh, are the lots that's been proposed to be built at this time by Woodbridge. So this initial um, final PD will involve 44 units out of the 752 single family um, units at the Maryland. I think about two weeks ago, we also uh, we brought the, uh, the preliminary plan development district of the uh, multi-family development to the west of these uh, units to you, if you will recall. So going to the specific uh, proposal again, as I mentioned earlier, this involves uh, 44 uh, initial units that have been brought to you. And each of the, out of the 44 units, there are three, uh, four specific plans that's been proposed to you. In other words, there will be four different types of plants. Each of those four plants, we have three variations of uh, elevations. So again, I'm, I'm just gonna give a brief overview. When uh, Mr. Cunningham comes up, he will uh, go more into details. But here is just a site, uh, a portion of the site plan and the plot plan of where uh, those homes will be sited. I know that you usually don't go into development standards itself, but I also want to mention that uh, because of the uh, development standards and design guidelines that were previously approved by the council, this project conforms to all the development standards. So for instance, setbacks, heights, and density, all those are consistent with the development standards uh, previously approved for this project. So again, um, this is, uh, the other part, this is the second portion of uh, the plot plan. And um, underneath that, you will see the typical layout of um, or the blowout of um, the homes itself. And I mentioned earlier on that uh, the, the 44 units will consist of four different plant types. That is plant one, two, three, and four. So this elevation you see now on the board uh, on the monitor uh, represents those uh, four different elevations. This is so, and I also mentioned that each of the, uh, the plant types will have three types of elevations, and those are designated as elevations A, B, and C. So this is, so what you're seeing now on the monitor is plan one with the proposed three types of elevations. So these are the exterior elevation of plan 1A, the enhanced version of plan 1. So this is plan 2, the three, um, the three proposed elevations for plan 2, A, B, and C. And these are the, um, the rear, the side, the right side, and the left side of the elevations. This will represent, um, this is plan type 3, and it's three elevations. All these are in your, and much more details are provided in the packages uh, that were provided to the AAC. Uh, the, and these are the, um, the rear, the side, the right, and the left side elevations of the proposals. So finally, this is um, plan type four. In addition to the uh, defining characteristics that are uh, contained in the development guidelines, much, both materials and uh, landscaping were part of what you recommended for approval when it came to you um, uh, as, as a preliminary plan development district in 2016. So the materials that I used there, I do have um, the material board that I proposed. All these are, of course, taken from the pre-approved materials. Yes, sir, thank you. 
both by the AAC and the council, uh, PC and council. So this, these are just side sessions which shows, illustrates the, the heights. And as I mentioned before, they are all consistent with the approved uh, development standards for the development. This is our more of the site plan. So these, these are the, the, in addition to the, um, the final PD, we also have the final plan development districts for uh, the landscaping. The typical uh, front yard landscaping for the single family are consistent with what was previously approved. And I mentioned in the memo about uh, focus lots. Those are usually lots on the, uh, that are more visible within the site. And those are to be treated or to be given an extra treatment just because of their location. So those are either uh, on the intersections that are visible or in the corners. So a very good example is the one that you see now. And in one of the, the recommendations that staff made, uh, assuming you are going to approve this, is to um, ask for an enhancement of that landscaping. Uh, there are the three species of trees that are proposed there are consistent again with the list of trees. However, uh, staff uh, believes that that could be enhanced, add more variations uh, to the plants, to the shrubs, and to the trees itself to make it a little bit much more um, pleasing, aesthetically pleasing than what we currently have. So um, finally, before I call on uh, Mr. Cunningham, staff is recommending approval for this project based on those four uh, recommended uh, conditions and um, those are again based on staff's evaluation of the project against the design guidelines uh, that is the controlling document for this uh, development. Uh, one of it has to do with the use of stone veneer. Uh, in, in the elevations where stone veneer uh, were used, staff feels that they are a little sparse, they, they feel out of place, so uh, that could be enhanced. And that in addition to other areas that the AAC might see fit to make um, this project more successful is what staff will recommend. And that will conclude my report. I'm available to answer your questions before we call on the developer. Thank you. Thank you, Edward. Mm -hmm. Okay, questions for staff? Yes, Member Robert. Thank you, Edward. Uh, you talked a little bit about the focus lot and that they're distinguished uh, a little bit above the other units. But as I look at the um, landscape plan, um, it, unless I'm misunderstanding it, it almost looks identical in terms of planting as the house next door. So how do you, can you elaborate on how it's actually been upgraded? Yeah, so um, we are recommending that, uh, number one, there should be just I'm thinking there could be more creativity, especially on this, if I can go right here. Is it on the, on the uh, side street that they're? Yes, on the side street, the yeah, on the side street. This is where I'm asking for my enhancement. Uh, this, these are pretty much consistent with what we uh, previously approved okay. in, in terms of the quantity of planting and in terms of the species of trees that are being proposed here. But here, I'm just thinking that um, a little bit more could be done, uh, maybe additional groupings, additional plantings, add more sizes of plantings there. That could make it a little bit more okay. Thank um, you. desirable. Thank you. Okay, and and Mr. Madam Chair, if I can just add one more. You know, yeah. in, in working with this um, developer for a while now, I, I know that they will be amenable to um, make those. Um, they will be. They will be. They will be open to meeting those recommendations, the ones that staff has and the one that the agency may have. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? Yes, Member Tom. I, <clears throat> excuse me. I think this is a staff question. On the lots that have the exclusive use easement behind them, so they have the deeper yards. Correct. What's the fencing material that separates the houses? So I do have, uh, I think, if, oh, sorry. And to follow up with that question, is there any landscaping other than just the front yard? Will the backyards all just be vacant when the people close escrow? I do believe that. Um, if I'm right, I think it's not up to the developer to do the landscaping in the rear yard, but they are, but they are responsible for providing the landscaping in the front yard. 
I thought I had the um, defensing materials, uh, but if we go to page, yeah, so we we'll see uh, the, the defense details. So, so that rear yard will be the tubular steel correct. fence. Correct, will be uh, tubular steel fence. Thank correct. You. More like viewing fence, if you will. Any other questions for staff? I, I yes, question. Member Tom. <clears throat> Edward, Sorry. so with the landscape plan that's proposed here, they will come back in the future with a detailed uh, plan. I mean, I mean they've, they've kind of given a list of plant materials that correspond to certain symbols. Yeah, so when next time they come back, will be staff review only. That's when we do. So there, there are three stages of uh, uh, review for landscaping. This is just the very first one, although it, it is the last time that the AAC will see this. Uh, when it comes back to staff, we will do the, uh, that's when we will review the detailing, the irrigations, and to make sure that it is consistent with our technical guidelines. And, and will we have a chance to review that, or will that just be at a staff level? It, it is only at staff level. However, it is if it's at your pleasure to see them, we'll be happy to bring them back to you, if, if that's the condition. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, is the applicant present? Mr. Cunningham, hello again. <laughs> Well, he, you know, he, 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 he needs this. Oh, yeah. But he also needs a microphone. Um, Maybe. Oh, you want to come here? Okay. This one? Microphone. Yeah. My name's Todd Cunningham, uh, 75417 Spyglass in Indian Wells. I'm the president of Woodbridge Pacific Group, and uh, I'm representing the company in this session. Um, the project is in the Maryland community, which has been re repurposed from a golf course to the olive groves, and we're real excited to be part of this. Um, the significance of the design of the homes is that we have, a long, we have a row of homes on both sides of this street. This is to the west with olive groves. The homes on the east side, there's a block wall. There's a street that comes in here and a block wall behind them, and it's very kind of nondescript, secondary entrance to the community. Nothing really back here um, and then also that we have a, a condition that we can't have uh, two-story elements within a certain distance of these homes over here so there'll be no two-story homes on this side of the street and any second story element on this side of the street has to be pushed off the street mm -hmm. so that we have I think it's 200 or 250 feet or something that we, before we hit a second story element so the the predominant view is to the west and the south, to the mountains, and it's, it's pretty good out there. So what we've designed on the west side of the street, which would be these homes, is that where all the pools are in the rear yards and the entertainment areas in the rear yards. And on the east side of the street, the pools are in the front, and the houses are pushed as far back as we can push them to the uh, setback. And then there's just a block wall right behind it, and then a street behind it, and there's really no view and no reason to be in the back of those homes when there's a view out the front. And we can put the entertainment areas and the pools and patio covers and such on the front of the, the front of those homes. That's what we did at our project in Sky. It was real successful to have front yards on one side and back, and front yard pools on one side and backyard pools on the other side, and take advantage of the view. 
these are front yard pools because they'll they'll have views to the to the south, kind of southwest. So those are the, the predominant features of the homes on the west side of the street, which is our plan one and two, and I'm sorry, on the east side of the street, and on the west side, which is our plan three and four, which is where there is a house with a two-story element to it. But yeah, let's, you can go to the next one. More of the same discussion. Keep going. Thank you. you you've already gone through this for me. So... We can keep going. We don't need. It, 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 we talked about the tubular steel fence in the rear of the homes on the west side. If we go, maybe if we go, yeah, keep going. I think there's another exhibit that comes up. This is this is the landscape thing we talked about. There is uh, paving. There are pavers and and asphalt combination on the front of those per the guidelines and the driveways. These are just where the model homes are going to go. This is. Uh, street scene elevation you can see on the on the west side there is a second story element but it's pushed back off the street you saw when edward's going through it showed those two story that two story element looked like the it was you know just mm -hmm. stacked right on top but it's not that second story element is pushed quite a ways back um, whereas on this side of the street there'll be no two story elements another view of the same street scene and these are the plan one, two, three, and four. We can see the two-story element there is pushed back. Um, the one thing about the plan one and the two, which is on the east side with the pools in the front, you pretty much are going to have a, uh, a two-car garage. These are 40-foot wide houses. So you got a 20-foot wide garage, and then you got a 20-foot area over here for the pool in front of the house. So there isn't too many different ways you can do that and get the pool in the front. So what we did is we added a stronger elevate entry element on one and then made it a little more low profile here and, and mixed them up as best we could given that uh, the footprints get to be similar in, in trying to get that pool in the front yard. The sides we did pop out. These are trade easement, zero lot, lot line, trade easement homes, seven foot and three foot. So we do have, uh, because we're three feet off the property line, this this would be the blank side of the house where these these windows are up high for privacy into the adjacent property. But we do we're able to get windows here because we're using a seven foot and three foot. Um, trade easement, so this house is three feet off the property line, which allows by fire code for us to get windows in there, but they're up high and won't uh, won't uh, imp mm -hmm. impinge on the privacy. And on the other side, you got windows and in, into the side yard. And on these plan ones and plan one and two, the back of the homes are backed up 10 feet from the wall in the back, so there isn't much articulation or anything on the back of those homes because it'll be a dog run or something behind that house. This is a plan two. The plan twos have a, a sloping element over the garage here. And it's hard to see here because the colors are similar, but as a way to, to, to kind of separate them, make them different from the plan ones. And then again, the side element. Um, we did pop out an element on the side of this so that the, the house on this side that uses this area up against this house in the trade easement area, it's not just a flat blank stucco where there is some relief uh, to, to help the aesthetic of that. Now we're on the other side of the street where the pools are in the backyard. We mixed up this house, these, L, these houses, so we're on the plan three, you enter along this side and you go, you hit a, a uh, element that that extends out from the side of the house back 20 feet or so which then directs you left into the the to the entry of the home and so this this plan has a side entry element to it if we go to the plan and there's the sides and rear and then on the plan four it's a centered you know entry in the center of the house and then again that's misleading help massive that looks but 
the second story elements push back. And that's the sides and rear. Floor plans, uh, this would be uh, the, the plan one where you've got a generous area for the pool. This is a metal cover, which is consistent with the architectural guidelines. There's two different types of covers in the guidelines, and we use both. And then uh, the pool and everything will go right out in front and the cover and then enter into the house. And plan two, oops, I don't know what this is. Um, yeah, keep going. Yeah, the different elevations. Plan two, same same thing as with the swimming pool area. This is a different style cover, and uh, uh, the trade easement side of the house is on the right. Going. This is more than we probably need to share right now, but. But we can get through these floor plans of RV and through them. Well, stop right there. This is the side entry where you come back and you hit this element here, which guides you into the side of the house. The plan four has the center entry, and then this is the trade easement side of the house. I think that's probably enough. If we could go to another, to back to the, um, there's one thing, and I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions, but there's one thing I'd like to ask you to consider is that the, if we can go to uh, up there, the design guidelines and the projects approved with metal windows, and metal windows. Um, are tougher to get, they're not as energy efficient, and they're more expensive. And the Marillon project, with where it is and, and how it's designed, is meant to be quite a bit more affordable than if it was a project in downtown Palm Springs somewhere. And the, I'd like to a consideration to use a vinyl window that has a uh, aluminum finish to it. This is a product, this is from uh, a couple of Toll Brothers projects in Essena, and they're using a metal window, I mean, a vinyl window with a aluminum color. Um, and then, yeah, I've got, I've got samples of those. This is the, this is a manufactured vinyl window with aluminum color to it, and then that's a metal window. And I've got this this window that I'm holding is, is that window right there. And it's not wholly different when you look at a picture than what a metal window would look like. And then also we've used uh, vinyl windows in our sky project. Yeah, if you go back to that. I'm sorry, vinyl sliding glass doors and vinyl windows. Escape? <laughs> no, no, it's not in there. It's, I'm sorry. It was, uh, yeah. Um, this image here. That's a vinyl window with a aluminum finish to it, aluminum colored finish to it. That's from our Sky Project. We used vinyl windows and vinyl doors like that when we had eight foot headed out sliding glass doors. When we went to tens and 12 foot doors, we used metal windows. Um, but that's been a successful window and very accepted. This is a plus or minus $2 million project. The toll project's a plus or minus 800 to 1,000 to a $1 million product, and they're using vinyl windows. And this project here is designed to sell five to $600,000, and the cost of the vinyl windows without creating or giving a better product is at cross purposes to that. 
So I, I'll go one more back to that. Uh, yeah, and it's the one right below it. Yeah. It's just another image of the vinyl window that we used. That's a vinyl uh, okay, slider. I think, I think we get it. Okay. We get it. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Um, I think that's enough. Is anybody here in the audience uh, to make comments on this project? If so, you have this chair to come up. Wow. There's a lot of people in the audience. <laughs> OK. Well, I, I have is our landscape architect, team? our color consultant, and okay. our architect here. All right. So questions for you guys. OK. So we definitely have questions. And I'm going to start with Robert. Robert. Um, let's start with the site plan. Um, I understand now from your explanation why you don't have any two-story units on the one side of the street. Uh, but have you given any further thought to sort of mixing it up a little bit more so that you don't have all the threes and fours on one side and all the ones and twos on the other? I think in terms of creating a streetscape, it might be more interesting. If you were it might be more it interesting, but if you had one of those houses where the back of the house faced at east and all those nice mountains are faced out to the west, and you put a plan three or four on the other side of the street, you're putting the pool in the backyard facing east against a block wall and no view of anything. So that's the reason for doing that. And so when you put front yard pools on one side of the street and backyard pools on the other side of the street, that's what you end up with. And that, you know, when we, I keep, I keep going back to Sky Project, but we have basically four floor plans, two plans on one side of the street with a pool in the front yard and two plans on the other side of the street with pools in the backyard. So you go up and down that street and there's two plans, two different plans on one side and two different plans on the other. It looks great. looks fine. Um, and then uh, just to, out of curiosity, the, uh, starting at lot 214 and going down, is that What's happening with those? Is that a different project? Is that part of what you'll do? In yeah, these phase? these are six thousand square foot lots. Our project is five thousand square foot lots. That'll be it either either we'll do them sometime in the future, or another builder will build those. But those aren't part of the the project because they're different lot sizes. Okay. And as I read through the uh, write up on the um, different um, the the monop monop. Monotony, thank you. Yeah. Monotony code and the inspiration for the three different variations. Uh, the write ups are great. I'm not sure I think the execution is great. Um, so ta let's talk about specifically uh, the sloped parapet on one of the plans. Yes. Where did that come from? I, it's an element that uh, the architect and ourselves thought would be appropriate to intermix so that there was a different different element down the street versus the same element over the garages. The garages are dominant. They're 40 foot wide houses. The garages are 20 feet wide. So, you know, to try to do something on a one story home above that garage to to mix up the street scene, that, that was the effort. Uh how, how much of a cantilever is there on the eyebrows over, over the garage and some of the other elements that you have? I'm going to defer to Steve. Two feet. I think they're two feet. Two feet? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I'm, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Member Kennedy Reviewer. Uh, sure. At this point, it seems to be one question. Yeah. Um, hi there. On your okay. favorite subject of vinyl uh, windows and yes. sliders. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I beat that up. <laughs> no, you were, you were trying to sell it. I get it. Um, my, my, can you talk a little bit about how those perform in the desert in the long run? I was always under the impression, and I'm probably the least educated at this table on the subject, so uh, can you talk a little bit on how they perform in the desert? Because I was always under the impression they don't do well in the desert in the long run. Maybe the, the Boy, we use nothing but vinyl windows. Um, we haven't had any problems with vinyl windows in the desert, but I would venture to say 10 years ago there might have been problems, but the products improved pretty dramatically in the last 10 years. Yeah. So maybe that's, so, what's, maybe that's yeah, what's changed. We, we don't have any 
issues today. Sorry. Okay. All right. That's the only question I have right now, but I'll reserve the right to come back. <laughs> okay. Member Tom Dozy, questions? I just I had a couple questions in, in referring back and forth between the landscape typicals and then the um, Architecture. architectural design guidelines. Um, one question I had was it appears that there's a 10 foot utility easement um, adjacent to both curbs mm -hmm. and the guidelines require there to be you know, trees to be installed three feet away from the utility easement or from utilities. So does that mean three feet from the easement or I'm trying to see how you fit all that in. It, it was a little bit of an exercise to fit it in. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if it's going to work. <laughs> yeah. ja so, Jamie is our landscape architect. So. We actually uh, contacted the city Jamie, when we, oh, sorry, Jamie Walton, uh, 1793 West Arrow Highway, Upland. Um, we actually contacted the city when we saw the guidelines and saw where things were, and they said that we could go with a three-foot uh, setback, and it's going to be a bit of a puzzle uh, fitting it all in there. We've tried to do our best effort. Um, the, the next, three feet. Um, I guess, question or would it So it's three feet from the utility, not three feet from the easement. Right, okay. okay. And they'll hopefully bunch them all right up behind the curb there someplace, hopefully. I know, but the other question is why not? Why wasn't it placed on the street? The utilities? The utilities? Well, those, that's your gas and electric. It's, it's typically in a, uh, an easement behind curb. Mm -hmm. Ten foot utility easement. Yeah. I mean, and in some areas, you know, the, the building unit is almost ten feet off the right. curb. So yeah. it's. Okay. Um, and that's just, that, it's built. Those utilities are in the ground. Oh, that's right. And then um, the other question is, and, and this might be for Edward, um, where it is, if you look at, at the perspective views, um, they're very well done and there's a lot of detail in that. But on the actual typical planting plans, there's not a lot of detail. So um, I guess my concern is, is will that do we need to see that level of detail now, or do we want to let staff handle that level of detail? And, and, and going back to the trees, if you look at the rendering, like perspective scene one or two, and if you started placing a 36-inch box tree on every lot, you're pretty much not going to see the buildings. And, and I think the, the composition that occurs in the renderings is, is very pleasing. And what it might mean is maybe they look at uh, doing almost a street tree plan um, for where they want their major trees and then they can have their accent plants uh, because I think if you just look at it as a typical and start plugging these in you know you're not going to see I mean, it will be tree after tree after tree and and even in the uh, proposed exhibits you know the Palo Verde is is the canopies showing less than 20 feet if, if the garages are 20 feet you know, typically you would show that canopy at a 25-foot diameter, so it, it would take up a lot more space in this graphic view. So I didn't know if there's any flexibility in those design yeah. guidelines. Yeah, uh, so Madam Chair, if I may, I could add one more to those uh, conditions that were recommended to you, and that would be that uh, should uh, this, um, should you make a, a recommendation for approval to the Planning Commission today that the landscape, a final landscape plan with more detailed information uh, will be brought back to the AAC for review. Mm. Okay. Just to add on to that, we would probably condition that so it comes back prior to the issuance of building permits for the homes, and so we would tie it into the uh, approval of permits. Okay. Thank you. Tom, you can have any questions on the architecture? Um, I'm going to leave that to the architects. <laughs> Tom. <laughs> Question for the developer. <clears throat> the uh, 
metal trellises that are in the front yard that are adjacent to the pool. Will the developer be installing those, or are those options that homeowners would buy or not buy? We are installing them. On all the, all the lots? Yes. And what about the eyebrows above the garage and some of the windows? Are those a steel eyebrow? What's that made of? No, it's a stucco and it's just a stucco color, color blocked. Yeah. Thank you. OK. Um. So if you look at uh, Prospective Street Scene 2, okay, especially on the left side. So uh, Mr. Cunningham, you completely correct in the sense of that it's really the garage is like the main sort of feature, right? And it repeats in the same place every time, right? And then the second most repetitive uh, feature is the enclosure of the CMU wall for your front yard, okay? So the entire sort of sequence of massing is enclosure, CMU enclosure, some addition, either entrance or a room, and then you have the garage. And that those three elements sort of repeats all the time. So I understand of the limitations because these are dense lots, but there's not enough variation on your CMU block wall design. You, you do this wonderful job on selecting different styles for garage doors and then also for entry doors. But especially entry doors is so many feet away from the actual front presentation of the home. And my concern is that the block walls are just going to dwarf, you know, all the details that you're creating now in that courtyard design. Yeah. So in the design guidelines, when you look at the fences, there are variations on the fence design. Some are more open, closed, open, closed, or some have sort of, I call it medallion blocks, you know, that introduce a different profile. Um, but right now, it. It's, it's looking as if the block wall, it's the most predominant sort of urban design that you're creating in this street. Well, um, we can certainly mix up the block wall design. We could do a block wall with stucco, then we could do a square stack precision, and then we could do a more linear block. I mean, we're open to mixing that up. Um, as far as the, uh, what have we got, breeze, breeze block? You know, mm -hmm. that has the... Correct. Breeze block. Breeze block. Yeah. yeah. We can't use that with a swimming pool in the front yard because it's not legal because you can step you up climb. and over. Yeah. Right. But you can so. use the burnished blocks or you can use the 4-inch uh, proportion instead of the 8-inch as it was shown in the design guidelines. Yes. Okay. So there are variations that you can do with a block. And, and we're fine in doing it. Okay. Now, when it comes to the garage... Um, I understand the challenge of how do you make this garage more um, more flexible, right? And and I understand why the slope roof, um, but it's it's foreign to what I think you're creating. So the other thing that is in these design guidelines is something like a flat roof with a two foot overhang, something that changes the the roof line of the garage. So it's not all parapet. Have you and your team considered that? Because it's only 20 feet deep. You're not putting any equipment on top of that. Correct. So you're, so you're suggesting a, well, on this side of the street, a lower element above the door r r without a parapet? Yeah. So on uh, Miralon design guideline, uh, where it says plan 2A, 2B, and 2C. I think it's page 19. Page 19, correct. Yeah. I don't know if you don't have the design guidelines? Okay. Yeah. See the top left view? I know it's not the garage. Right, that's I know that's a, a living unit per se, but it does introduce a flat roof with an overhang. 
Yeah, we we did bring the garages down because they were originally masked up to the parapet height of the, the home itself. Right. So we dropped it down. But you know, but just like what you're creating with the uh, eyebrows, you're creating this shadow line right into the building so that it has these intricacies. And every garage, um, because of the parapet, there's there's no variation on shadows um, that yet that you could potentially create on the street. Can we lower that parapet anymore? And then cr have a roof overhang? So uh, this is Samir Hanoush. Uh, uh, so you're saying maybe lower some portions of it, of the garage? No, add, so, you can lower it, but you can also add a flat roof overhang. Oh, the, the whole thing, you mean? Yeah. We can do that, but, but then we need a parapet also. When you extend that out, you need a little parapet to slope the roof. However, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so but the, the idea is that you have parapet garages and then you have flat roof garages. Mm -hmm. So now you're introducing a different modern element still, but yes. it's a different look to the garage. So you don't have, you know, 26 homes all looking the same. Okay. I mean, I, I don't like to do the whole thing coming out. Maybe extend a piece here and then drop it and then come out. I don't think it needs so, another break. You have a lot so, of breaks on this on the mass. Okay, so the, the whole garage yeah, you're saying. You need something to to keep it calm. Hmm. So the roof, okay. The we can the do that. Oh, Todd, oh. microphone. Sorry. There's a there's a scissor truss that spans and drains to the side. So it's got to have a certain amount of flow from this side of the garage down to that side of the garage. And the, we just need a parapet enough to cover that, that slope roof. But why can't you have, I'm sorry, not why can't you. Could you, could you consider a, uh, an eighth inch per foot, a quarter inch per foot, single ply, cool roof that has a two foot overhang, right? And you can have the roof drains. Actually, you don't even need roof drains because it's a one-story situation. We, we can do that. We can do that if that looks better. Yeah, you're introducing a different roof type. Yes, yeah. So maybe one of the plants will have it. Uh... Yes, yes. The second okay. question. And then, and then we don't need this one. When you do that, of then you don't need of the course. one over the garage. Yeah. The second question is about your, I think, the paint selection, it's, it's very nice. W could you entertain that maybe a whole house has a dark tone and then a whole house has a light tone instead of just breaking it to the mm. living room or to the yes. guest b bedroom? Hi, I'm Hi. Ann Madison um, from Newport Beach, but I also have a house in Racquet Club Estates, so I'm very familiar with Palm Springs. And my house, when I purchased it, was dark, and I cannot wait to paint it a light color. <laughs> it's just oppressive to me. So I'd rather keep the dark as an accent, if possible, just because of the freshness and light and coolness that you get from a lighter field color. You know how hot it gets out here. A dark color is just, it just radiates heat. I didn't want to make it too dark. Well, then why not pick a whole entire lighter intensity color altogether. If we don't need to do color blocking, we can just eliminate the dark accents and have it be light like sky. Right, right now what's happening is that you have about 20% of the house with a color. Mm -hmm. So the, the whole massing is, is that you have a background that has this ins and outs, and then you have an accent. Mm -hmm. the, the accent should be in such a way that either is much more balanced, either half or the whole, or you introduce that accent color in other places as well. Yeah, we were limited to kind of where you can break the color, because you can't break it in the middle of a plane. You have to wait for it to wrap all the way into an inside corner. So um, these elements have a place for the color to terminate. Yeah, but the top addition with a single window. Where it, yeah, but it doesn't. On that side, it's all on the same plane. OK, so carry the whole color all the way to the end. 
but the, not that I don't want to do that with the dark color. Is what I'm saying. Okay. I wouldn't mind getting rid of the dark color and having it, them all be light uh, I, at all. I agree with you about dark tones, but right now dark tone, tones and gray tones are in, and we were told that um, I don't know, but we were told <laughs> that it doesn't make that much difference. Okay, so it doesn't. It really it does. My backyard gets when you're close to the wall. It's so hot. Like I cannot wait to use one of these colors on my Palm Springs house because it's it's and it, to me it's just so much fresher and and the landscape pops and the backdrop of the mountains is just so much cleaner. Right, but right now you have the same base tone down the street. Yeah. So. Yeah. So you got to come up with some variation. Either there's variation in the field colors, and you'll see it in the sun. But um, are you saying to introduce more of the dark color than what's there now? I mean, we could, but we just need to make sure there's a place for it to stop, because that might end up. <clears throat> I'd have to look at all four sides. But we went through these um, at Samir's office, and we put these where we could without doing it overkill. But I believe this carries all the way back. So you'd end up with it in the backyard. It would end up going, having to go all the way around. OK, so pick another mm -hmm. color that is not as dark, but it actually em emphasizes that there is another massing that is part of the entire home. We originally had three field colors. And to me, it was looking very dated 90s. So we eliminated the, the middle tone. <clears throat> I wanted to keep it super clean because the architecture is so crisp. OK, got it. Got it. But of course, you're the boss. I will add if you want me to, but I, I don't know. I'm afraid of making it too much like what happened in the 90s. OK. <laughs> OK. Um, all right, uh, Todd, I had a couple more questions. Yes. On the second floor, are the windows also recessed? On the front. On the front? Yes. OK. Um, and then the um, you mentioned that there were asphalt on the driveway, but it's not. It's concrete, right? Two strips it's of concrete. It's concrete and, and pavers. And pavers in between. Yeah, not asphalt. Yeah. OK, good. Um, and then just a question. On, on the backyard of the units that are facing the um, the olive trees. Mm -hmm. Are those also fenced, or is it sort of open? Yeah, it's they're fenced, and there is you had an exhibit up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see the tubular fence. But yeah, the tubular tubular fence goes extends to the back of the home, and then into the use easement, and then across the back, right, and right, then back. But, but it is fenced. Too it bad is it fenced. Just, I, I understand. Well, if you secure. have a dog or something, you yeah. need you need to be fenced. Okay. All right. Um, okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry, any additional questions from the applicant before we close our questions? No? Okay. Uh, Todd, one more question. The, sorry, the, uh, no the reason why the homes were not mirrored in order to create a variation again on the street is because of the trade easement because uh, you have an open side of the home that needs to face the blank side of the home okay. and it, and it kind of just repeats when you do a trade easement or a zero lot line okay yeah yeah a question i have and it might just be the rendering and you can see it in that rendering the steps going up to the orange gate appear to be extra deep steps so you're almost putting, needing to step on the step twice. And hmm. I notice, especially in the street scene drawing, street scene number two. And it looks like there's a little wedge-shaped wall separating the driveway from the lot next to it. Is that like a curb, or is it, is it just something that was done in the rendering that doesn't really yes, exist? Sir. Yeah. Yeah, which one are we talking here? There, yeah. I think there, we will have to have a curb there. But it's a wedge-shaped curb yes. increasing in height. 
And what about the steps going into the unit? Are they just normal 12 inch treads or are they extra deep? No, they are, they are the normal, yeah. So then these will all have handrails on them? Uh, yeah, you don't. It's, I guess what I, I'm not understanding is I don't know how I don't see something that shows what the pad level is in relationship to the to street. The house, yeah. It's gonna be like like garden steps. But if you have more than three, I believe if you but, have more than uh, three, you need a handrail. Yeah, hand but it's, it's following the terrain. It's not like becoming deeper. Okay, we'll we'll ask for clarification. Yeah, we will have to get to our engineer and see if we can get the pads up separation from the street. Right, because to I, you, I'm pretty sure you don't want handrails. We don't want handrails. Yeah. Okay. Thank you again. Okay. Then. Um, I, I'll start with this, even though um, I'll start with this. I think it's a handsome project. I, I'm having difficulties um, in really getting it to the extra mile, which is the design guidelines, which are beautifully done, and then how do they translate now when we have 30 homes in a row, right? Because we're, we're trying to make these variations on, on homes that were meant to be by itself, but it's together with other homes. So my major concern is how do we make it a little more with variety so that they can be an individual identity that comes together with the entire site. And that's where my questions were leading towards. Okay. So um, having said that, I'll start with uh, Member Robert. Comments? Um, yeah, I think it's the project's got great potential. Um, I'm I think the uh, Legoretto, the variation C, is probably the weakest uh, consistently. And what bugs me um, a lot is the use of the stone. Um, it looks like it's just kind of tacked on. And so when you, when you look at the gu guide, uh, design guidelines and you look at the write-up of what it's supposed to represent, um, and you look at the architects that are referenced, uh, Wexler and Cody and Legoretto, um, and you look at the examples that are in the design guideline, there's a purity of form and there is a simplicity of form. And I'm not seeing that translate in these designs. And it's sort of what Maria is saying as well, is that there's, it's, um, there, needs, uh, there, there needs to be a little bit more variety. There le needs to be, in my opinion, more simplicity. Uh, and honesty in the use of the architectural elements um, in both uh, variations A and B uh, in the design guidelines they have deep overhangs that are simply integrated with support um, elements I don't really see that translating here um, whether it's the uh, uh, cabana over the um, in the in the front loaded pool areas uh, you know those are detached from the house as opposed to being integrated if they were integrated and became a strong uh, canopy element with the steel posts, I think it would be a better, it would look better. Um, and then to carry that around um, to a covered entry like in plan four, um, you know, to do, to really sort of simplify it. Um, as I look at, uh, I don't know what sheet this is, the perspective exterior elevations of the four different unit plans, the, the use of the stone in both plans four and two, um, it's just kind of an added element. It doesn't have any sort of structural uh, or sort of uh, architectural integrity. It just looks like a plant on. And to me, if you're gonna do the stone, you should carry it all the way, like in plan four on that sheet. If you're gonna use the stone there, I would carry the stone all the way back to the entry door so that it looks like a stone wall as opposed to just a plant on. Um, I, I personally, I think I have trouble with the um, slope parapet. Uh, I wonder when you come up the street from the, the downside of the slope, what you see. Um, the renderings show it only from one side, one angle. So I, I, I really think that is uh, uh, 
an architectural element that's foreign to the community, and I would suggest that maybe they rethink that. Um, and also, the color palettes, uh, they're beautiful together, but I think they also could be tweaked a little bit. Um, uh, the dark tones seem to be really dark by comparison to the main color of the, stu the uh, colors, the, uh, the stucco. Um, I would love to see more variation on the streetscape. I don't know how you do that given the unit plans that you've developed. Um, but I, I just, I think it's uh, to have 40 some homes on one street and they're just repeated ap one after the other, I think it's a little too monotonous. So those are my thoughts. Okay, member Kenny. I couldn't have said that any better. You, <laughs> you, the the common theme I that I was trying to get to, and you and you pulled it all apart into the details, is the intersecting planes. The intersecting planes that are shown in the design guidelines are missing in the in the execution and the elevations. The 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 wall uh, tack on or add on, as you called it, is the perfect example of how the stone stacks up a few feet back but doesn't look like a plane it looks like a tack on so if that wall were to continue back to the entryway it looks more like a plane um so i think that's what's bothering me more than anything else and the other good example that you mentioned was the the overhang over the front door how it's not attached or integrated into the house if that were an intersecting plane coming out above the front door and i realize I, w I want to be sensitive to the budget here as well. We're talking about a five to six hundred thousand dollar house, like you mentioned, and not a nine hundred plus dollar house. Um, so uh, somewhere in there, there's there's where I'm trying to find the balance to to provide uh, suggestions that are executable within that budget. Um, but that's your job. <laughs> uh, so that I think I think the. The balance between variety as we go down the street, uh, but simplicity of design that is more true to the design guidelines is is where I'm struggling to find this, the the constructive uh, suggestions. Um, but maybe somebody around the table will be able to be more constructive than mine. So that's that's my general comment. Okay, Member Tom Dozy. I agree with the previous comments about the architecture, but also with if there's a possibility for the paint schemes. Um, somehow, when looking at the side elevations, you do see some of them are flat, but some do have some elements. Mm -hmm. And if, uh, especially where they have the architectural elements along the front elevation, if those could be uh, stronger in terms of paint coverage. And then um, pretty much the landscape uh, comments stand. I, I think it would be helpful if they labeled uh, the unit, the typical units don't call out whether it's a plan A, plan B, mm -hmm. if those mm -hmm. could be labeled. But really, to develop a, um, a streetscape scene, you know, using, you know, the larger uh, accent trees where they can, and then maybe not every house per the guidelines needs to have a, a large canopy tree in front. I think it, mm -hmm. you'll want to feel some of that openness um, along the street frontage as these units are, are built out. Okay, member Tom Digway. Well, I don't have any arguments with anything that's been said. I think it's all appropriate. Um, the stone really caught my eye at first too. It just seemed like it was such a small piece and it didn't really do anything. Um, the other thing that's kind of one of my pet peeves is when you have a pair, two different parapet heights, that they don't just blend it into the same wall. One of the parapet heights, the wall surface needs to be in front of or behind of the other parapet height. <clears throat> Excuse me. I can totally understand your wanting to keep the architecture along the side yards of the houses very simple because it really isn't seen. But I think whenever we have a situation in the front elevation, and possibly even the the lots that are loaded against the olive orchard might need a little more play back and forth on the on the planes of the building. So I think that um, 
these are all very good comments, um, but I think we need to um, go back and get the architecture as well as the really the street plan landscape design uh, because the landscape uh, design in front of the yard is it's, it's not something that we can mimic. Uh, and as you mentioned, your ren the renderings that they have submitted has more of a variation and more of a street design uh, than what is being proposed right now. Um, I think there's definitely really great potential here. There really is. Um, but we hope, I hope that they can hear our comments um, and see how they can make a little more unique, but at the same time um, be able to look at the streetscape and then how it, it, it becomes harmonious for that first block for single family homes. So I think we need to see this again. So do we have a motion to continue the project based on these comments? I move. Okay, do we need to list them more properly? Because this is a rather extensive list, I don't think that we would be able to just come up with a one, two, three, four, five. There's uh, quite a list of comments. What we will do is we will summarize our notes uh, from your discussion here today and provide those to the applicant and would we'll also be happy to sit down with the applicant and to review the comments with them. Um, if, if I could ask so that it, it will save all of us time, it would be nice to know, okay, this rendering is a la Legoreta style and it has the recess windows and the high volumes. You know, this rendering is, you know, based on this design guideline style so that we can have a comparison of what the origin of those designs were. That would be quite helpful. I, I would also, if it's not on the list, add the comments about um, the grading and the steps. How, oh yes. How that yeah. will be addressed. Yeah. If if they're going to be, if there's one or two, or if there's six, seven, you know, that that creates much of a different design. Yes, Member Tom. Um, I assume the pads are graded, so they must be able to tell us the pad elevations for all of the different pads, so we can see. Not only that, what? the utility is already in, yeah. so top of curve also. I think it would be va very helpful to have the, the pad elevations. Yeah. Okay, so Member Robert, did you have a motion? I did. I move to continue. Okay, anyone second that? I'll, I'll second. Member Kenny? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? This one, that. the no. actual like uh, parcel map, it was done, I think like eight years yeah, ago. Right, when yeah. Course, yeah, yeah, when it was uh, Avalon instead of Miralong. Madam Chair, I just wanted to get some additional direction. I realize you've already taken a vote on the case and continuing it. Did you have any thoughts on the vinyl windows? That's something that Mr. Cunningham spent a lot of time discussing with you, but we didn't hear any comments back from the committee. So just maybe as an addendum, if you have any thoughts on the use of the vinyl windows, that might be helpful for the applicant to hear that now. Uh, I think the, the, the comment that I would make on the vinyl windows is that uh, the example that's presented here uh, it seems to achieve mostly the look of what I think people are usually going for when they say use aluminum windows. The only question I had that I didn't get to asking was, 
can they be finished with the stucco up to the edges in the same way that a, a aluminum window typically is in a more in an older project. I know where I live, uh, we have aluminum windows, and when we replace them, it's required. It's requested aluminum, required aluminum, but we also can't use the flange or trim around the edge. You have to finish the stucco right up to the edge, like the original windows were. So I think how it's finished off and what kind of trim around it lends uh, goes a long way in helping it to fit in with these design gu design guidelines that we're probably trying to uh, keep in tune with. Unfortunately, we haven't. We were not as specific to say what is the sash, the size of the style or the the sash on the aluminum window because the finish you cannot tell that is vinyl or aluminum. So the you finish, you're good. I think it's more on the profile of the window. So when it came to aluminum, I think we were looking at a not at a that's probably about a half an inch less than half an inch, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so the idea was that the reason why we wanted sort of like the international aluminum window is because we wanted to have a, a, a much more Modern. aluminum uh, width. Am I saying that right? Yeah. Yeah. Profile. <laughs> Profile. So um, I think that's where we're having an issue on. Okay. Yeah, there needs to be more aluminum. So if we can find a prof a, a window section that has twice the distance of that, twice the dimension, that would work. <coughs> so normally, aluminum window, this part, it's a little bit wider. So by the time the plaster comes in, you don't just see this, you see much more um, aluminum frame. So this one being vinyl, it just limits it to... Oh, this is aluminum. Okay, but the look was that... Oh, man. You just proved their point. That's what the stucco finishes right to here. Okay. That's what I was trying to describe. This one, the stucco finishes right to here. You see a lot more... Metal you see a lot finish. more metal around these. Right. All right. I think right. that's the that's the stumbling point in, yeah. in yeah. that for me. It doesn't look like an aluminum window. It's finished like an aluminum window, but it, it won't look like one when it's installed. Like I think is the stumbling. So you you can't get one without. Yeah, you need this assembly here. Well, if you look at. If we can go back, if you want to take the time and look at some of those those pictures I had. I, I thought, the, yeah, I thought the pictures. If you look at, if you can go back to those images, that one, that's a vinyl door, but it, it's got, I mean, it looks like a metal door to me. But. There, were, there was a close-up image frame. of that, I think. It was maybe the next image. It was a closer-up image of the door slider door handle. Yeah. yeah. I think this final window is kind of a bad sample because yeah. it's got that kind of trim on it that doesn't yeah. really exist on these. Yeah. The what? The, the, I think the, the sample you brought is a oh. bad sample because it's got that extra piece of trim yeah. on it where in the photos it doesn't have it, so they look much cleaner. Yeah, so if you go back to... I agree with you. No, not that one. Sorry. This, this is a scene of windows up there. Yeah. So this is a project in, this is a toll project in a scene of, You can see up here it's pretty clean. And then this is the single hung down at the bottom, and that's what you're seeing here is is this versus the top part is cleaner. Yeah, but you still have the extra. Do you still have models at Sky? Yes. That we could go look at? Yes, because we use, we use some vinyl windows there with the aluminum finish on them. Okay. So 
maybe as a field trip individually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I'll go take a look at Sky and look at the vinyl windows there. It's not that window, it's a different window, but. I think the one at Sky is what we want. Yeah. <laughs> Well, let me let me look at an alternate alternative to this then. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for asking, Clint. <laughs> okay. Okay, any uh, comments from the committee? Actually, Madam Chair, yes. we have the added agenda item, the election yes. of officers. That's correct. And what we typically do is we accept nomination for the chair, we look for a second, take a vote on that, and then accept a nomination for the vice chair. Uh, why don't you go ahead and take those? So the question that I have is knowing that we're looking at a six additional months of this group together, um, we have two directions we can go. We can try and transition some new leadership into chair and vice chair so mm -hmm. that uh, so that they can benefit from uh, whatever mm -hmm. Maria and I have to add to the mix in six more months. Mm -hmm. Or we can continue to go the way we're going uh, with existing leadership. Uh, those, to me, seem to be the two options, so I want to throw those out there for discussion right. before we... Before so either we jump in... Or delay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> a better way of putting it, yes. <laughs> Member Tom. I think the concept of having the current chair and vice chair available to assist the new chair and vice chair during the transition is a benefit that probably you guys didn't have, and it might be something that's that's valuable to have. Mm -hmm. it's, it, we've got this one-time weird situation with the extra six months. So, Tom, let me just clarify that it would be good to have new um, candidates in the position so that Kenny and I could be on uh, an, AI, an AAC member so that if they have any questions about procedures, we're still here to guide them. That's, that's yeah. Exactly what I was yeah. To say. So, mentorship. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, um, there are two people that are not here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, even if we nominate them, uh. <laughs> and are they veteran members? They've they have not uh, been chair or vice chair. Right, but they've been on the committee so for some time. Sean came on when you and I came on. And, and Sean's Sean has been here a number of years. Yeah, I think Sean was an alternate for a little while, was he? Or Michael, I think he has a. I, I like yeah, his experience. So. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, but you also. Uh, Sean, assistant, I mean, attendance, consistency? He has missed more meetings than other members because of work commitments. Right. He has an office in uh, L.A. area and then over here. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I think Kenny and I are open to uh, either men, you know, mentorship or um, continuing on. Just throwing something else out, one of the things that the Planning Commission has discussed informally is keeping, uh, for example, the chair in position for the next six months and then having someone new serve as the vice chair as kind of a transition member so that way the vice chair potentially could become the chair in January. That's oh. so exactly what I was just going to suggest. Well, and just another option for you. Because then there's opportunity, sorry not to leave you behind, but there's opportunities for the, the new vice chair to cool. to chair a couple of meetings. We've got one coming up where you're not That's going true. to be here. Uh, as an example, um, that would be perhaps a good way to, to go. Remember, Robert, you were the um, sort of that second sort of senior in length. <laughs> Do you have any comments? Uh, I'm kind of in favor of deferring till January, personally. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'll express my opinion by making a motion. Okay. I'll I'll move that um, that we elect a member Song as uh, the chair for the next six months, uh, and then I'll I'll 
does that need to be a separate motion? You said. Yes, I do like positions. to do them as separate motions that okay. we consider them individually. So my, my suggestion is going to be that I will move that we uh, elect Member Song for another six months. Um, but the next motion that I would like to make uh, will be um, that we uh, elect um, one of the other three members that we have here as the vice chair uh, for the next six months. And then the new committee in January will be able to rearrange it again to their to their likings. Um, so the first motion would be to elect member Song for the next six months as chair. So do I have to agree or? <laughs> <laughs> Always helpful. <laughs> I would second that. <laughs> it helps you make up your mind. <laughs> so could you just repeat the motion? So the motion is to elect Member Song as the chair for the next six months that this group is together. And we and we have a second. Um, if you're willing to to do that with with the suggestion that I'll that I'll make is that we have we get you a new vice chair. Yeah, I, I think I was like the deal was like two or nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm willing to stay with you. I'm not, it's not that. No, no, no I, I understand. I understand. Um, no, I, 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 I humbly accept and I hope to do a better job in the next six months. Um, I, I, I think this is by far one of the most important committees for the city. Um, and, uh, and, you know, working with Glenn has been wonderful, so I accept. I think we have to vote on it first. Yes. <laughs> no, but I, I accept the nomination. Oh, good, good, okay. <laughs> so, I so you have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So then I will make a motion, unless somebody else has a, wants to jump in. I'll make a motion that the first person who seconded the first motion, which is member Jakeway, <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll nominate member Jakeway as the, as the vice chair. I will second that. I have a question. Yes. As part of your, as part of this new arrangement, are we saying that the vice chair automatically becomes the chair next December? We'd start no. with, okay. Yeah, then, the, the, then that's fine. The, the next uh, uh, member group, um, the next body in January, would do this all over again. I, I think if I may say, um, when, when, when playing the, this role, unfortunately, it's not, it, I enjoy very much being one of the committee members because then you really get to ask you know, the questions and what's applicable. And the role that you play here is almost sort of managing the information, you know, summarizing it, and then re-explaining it, and then making a conclusion. So when, when you're in this position, you, you're a bit more of a managing rather than a critiquer you know, with the findings. And so that's one of the things that I felt that I had to a little bit give up, you know, in order to play this role. So um, the reason why I say that is because I think you you are an amazing candidate, but also you have been, you know, sort of uh, been able to be, give all these different uh, comments, you know, as long uh, that that have been very instrumental. So you kind of have to manage the two, you know, being in the vice um, position. And if, I, if you don't do it enough, I'm probably going to say, so, Tom, what do you think about the question? <laughs> <laughs> what, I'll, what I'll add to that is, as, as was described to me, um, was the chair position ends up being somewhat of a traffic cop, just um, uh, facilitating the conversation. Um, and as the vice chair and chair tend to offer their comments last, uh, a lot of the things that we were all thinking have already been said. And I've joked about it a few times. It's great going last because I don't have anything left. I have to say, you all said it for me already. Um, so you do come around to if somebody didn't get to your items that you were going to talk about, now's your opportunity. Uh, so another reason why you probably have less uh, because you want to make sure you give everybody else the forum and the opportunity, and then they've covered it a lot of it. 
Yeah. You still managed to come up with a lot, though. <laughs> Is that a criticism? <laughs> no, not at all. An observation. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so I uh, think we have, a not, we have a motion. Yes, you have a motion and a second. Mr. Dosey was the second on that to uh, nominate Mr. Jay Quay as the vice chair. Okay, and then um, he had a question, but I think he was, uh, Tom, you were, okay. Yes. So, okay. so said we'll go that, ahead and call for the vote. vote. All in yeah. favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that also carries. Great. Okay. Thank you Thank very you. much. So, um, Flynn, I noticed we have a schedule. Is that changed from the previous one for us? Let's see. I don't know. I didn't get the same schedule. That, oh, yes, it did. You are dark in August. We won't be having any meetings during the month of August, and so we updated the schedule to reflect that. Also, there have been some minor changes to the city council schedule, and so those dates have changed as well. So we've provided all of our board and commission members a new updated schedule to reflect those changes. And the major thing is that coming back in August, I mean, in September, we'll see each other on a Tuesday? Correct. Okay. With the holiday, we will be meeting on a Tuesday. Yes, your next meeting will be here in the large conference room. We hope to be back in the council chambers in September. Okay. Oh, and Member Song is not here for the next Correct. meeting. I just remembered that. Sorry. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I was going oh, to be Mr. Jakeway, by so the way. Mr. <laughs> but, um, but on the next one, though, could, it, could Kenny um, chair it and then be Mr. Jakeway. If you would feel comfortable with that, Kenny, yeah, if you wouldn't yeah, mind chairing yeah. the meeting, yeah. and then Mr. Yeah. Jakeway, if you will yeah. serve as vice chair during that meeting, that would be helpful. And um, I have a question on, on, case, on, on the Avalon case, because it's such a large project. That is the first single family uh, case that Correct. came in. Okay. Correct. Okay, very good. Okay. Are they using a bunch of different, are they doing the same? Like a SENA where they got different development companies bought different groups of lots? Exactly. It will be much like a SENA so in that. This design guideline is what's going to give us continuity. Correct. That will carry through, and that's one of the reasons why it's so important to um, review these projects relative to the design guidelines so that there is consistency among the different merchant builders that will be there on the site. Okay, very good. So, um, if there's no other comments. I just have one comment. We do expect the Cameron landscape plan to be back on the agenda on July the 16th. There were quite a number of members who were not in attendance at the first meeting. One of the things I want to avoid at the second meeting is new comments. I want to have the discussion focused on those issues that the AAC brought up in the first hearing. Uh, and have our action reflect on whether or not they conform to those recommendations. And so if you were not in attendance at the first meeting, perhaps if you could uh, track down the video or the audio for that. Mm -hmm. um, we also have the minutes from that available in your packets, I believe, or else we yeah. will have the minutes Did available. Give them a summary of our comments? Yes. Can we have copies of that? Yeah. Yes. We'll be happy perhaps to do that. When, when you send out the notification I guess that would be the Thursday before the meeting. Maybe I can, is it, is it acceptable to grab that and do a reply all and ask that everyone make time ahead of time to review the minutes so that they're mm -hmm. reminded or familiarized yeah, with absolutely. all the comments? Okay. So we'll do that. Is it possible also to provide a link to the audio tape? I will try and do I that. I have no idea where, where you would find <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that. question. <laughs> Let me try and do that. My technical skills are not always <laughs> there either, but and, I'll try and do the link to the audio. And a separate item, um, I understand the city, and I have one now, is issuing um, email addresses for all commissioners and board members. And, um, and I think there's legal reasons to do that so that if something comes up, you're not, you don't have to give up all your personal emails because you're getting your emails from the city, you know, to your personal email. So I have, I've been assigned one already, um, but I'm still getting emails to my personal account. 
from staff? From, from you, from staff. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. I thought I had already updated you, but apparently I haven't. Okay. So I'll go ahead and make sure that staff does that. Okay. And anybody else on? I haven't received them. Well, no, I, well, I'm not sure how they're handling it. We happen to be in City Hall. and. Yeah. The city clerk is doing that on a case-by-case -case basis as the request comes in from the individual committee members. Uh, the issue at hand is if there was ever a public records request potentially it could reach back to your personal email and if you'd like to have some type of separation so that only city business comes to your city account uh, it's a fine thing to do so again if you just want to work with the city clerk they can set that up for you and mr rotman i know that we have it printed on our um, address sheet for all of our AAC staff members, we just haven't changed our personal outlook contact information for you, so I'll make sure staff does that. Okay. Okay, very good. It's uh, 521 and we're adjourned. Great. Thank you, everyone.